Part one of this series, we met a monkey who really wants to be the man. His family and friends are content to scrape out a meager living in the aftermath of an unseen tragedy. But our friend Moonwatcher here wants more, and who could blame him? Let's look at the condition of Kubrick's early Earthlings. Do they look happy and healthy to you? Do they look as if they could have evolved from some lower life forms into what they are now, with so little to eat and so little water? And where are the trees? When someone mentions monkeys or puts them in movies, there are two things that typically come to the mind of the audience, eating bananas and swinging from trees. 2001 Space Odyssey has plenty of monkeys, but there are no bananas, no green trees, no rain, and no forest was produced by a genius director who showed it to the Secretary General of the United Nations in a private screening before its release. Kubrick isn't so much telling us a story as he is describing the human condition. He's also describing the cure, but in a really subliminal way. Part 2 of the movie tells pretty much the same story as Part 1, except it takes place during a different era. Instead of one monkey picking up sticks against another monkey over a puddle of water, we see one politician unintentionally kill several perfectly good astronauts with an interplanetary mission to Jupiter. The death of the crew may not have been part of the mission plan, but it was acceptable to the mission planners, as we've seen in popular movies over and over again. In the original draft, Bellman was told a relief mission would be meeting him at Jupiter to bring him home, but it's revealed at the end of the movie that only the HAL computer knew the truth about the purpose of the mission, which means the mission planners lied to him. Probably lied about the relief mission too. Who knows? What we do know is that they all died out there in space, just like David Bowie said they would. Psychedelic Light Show represents his transition to the next form of being or death. It's shown to us too early and for very good reason. The Light Show has a purpose, and it's not just to entertain the hippies. Certain patterns of light and color can introduce very specific brainwave patterns in the mind of the viewer. That's why this movie begins with three minutes of darkness, and that's why these colors don't appear at the moment of Bowman's death. Kubrick wanted us to see something very important at the moment of death, something beyond the capital I, and he didn't really want those lights to interfere with our understanding standing of David Billman's reincarnation on Earth. This bedroom scene is probably the least understood part of the movie. First we have Bowman looking over his shoulder at the past while eating real food with a real knife. Not since the early Earth monkeys of the first scene have we seen anyone eating real food. So he gets to eat real food and sleep in a nice bed inside a well-appointed room. And these are the conditions of his death. Kubrick was trying to show that no matter who we are or what kind of life we've lived, this is the best kind of death any of us can wish for. Pass away quietly in our sleep. This is what David Bowman was thinking about while suffocating to death in his spacesuit. Hopefully Bowman hallucinated all of this in a flash before dying just like Major Tom or George Clooney or all the guys from the Independent Shuttle and there's no reason to believe he would have wanted it any other way. That is, until we reveal what's been left out of this picture. It's the most important thing in the world, but you have to leave it along with the world if you are born with a black eye like David Bowman was. This character obviously isn't a bad guy, but he didn't really live a full life on Earth because of his own innocent choices. After all, nobody kidnapped him and forced him to be an astronaut. He had to choose a career, he was a capable young man, and he needed the money. He wasn't going to Jupiter for any other reason than that. In fact, he had a little trouble getting the minuscule pay increase he had been promised for this extended trip. We find comments about money or poor economic conditions in a lot of space movies. They do this not to diminish the characters, but to support the idea of scarcity here on Earth. If there was an easier way to make money without leaving our homes and risking our lives, wouldn't we choose that? If Bellman had been born into an environment that offered him everything a person could possibly need for free, it's unlikely he would leave such a place for undetermined amounts of time, risking his life and potentially his soul in the process. Clark and Kubrick often discuss the question of whether or not the soul of a person who dies in outer space would be able to reincarnate on Earth, or if it would be forever lost to the void. One believes such a thing, the way David Bowman died out there in space, would be considered a fate worse than death itself. Reincarnation on Earth is a big part of Kubrick's message. After Bowman dies in his imaginary bed, a fetus is shown in place of his body. This represents the soul, and all it seems to be concerned with during these precious moments is that big black eye at the foot of the bed. We pass through the capital eye, and what do we see? The moon of Earth, hidden in plain sight. And then we see the soul looking down on Earth in all its majesty, keeping in mind that computer-generated shots like this were very hard to create in the 1960s, so every single frame matters. The movie ends with our newly incarnated soul, represented by this baby gazing down upon Earth from his position in orbit, which we can only hope is temporary. The baby's eyes are wide open and his hands are clenched in a manner which says, 
I want that. And then we see the shadow of an unseen black eye somewhere in space where the camera ought to be. What Kubrick is showing us here is the innocence inside every soul. Desire is perfectly natural, and when our environment provides enough of everything to satisfy everyone's desires, we've arrived at a little place we like to call paradise. When there's enough resources to go around, one person's desires don't have ill consequences for any other. That's why he placed those monkeys in the desert instead of the jungle. He was trying to draw a parallel with the real world, the world David Bowman left behind. If the monkeys were shown in the jungle, it would be impossible to demonstrate the effects of scarcity that Kubrick needed to show throughout the film. One person's innocent desires have consequences for another, the universe falls out of balance. That's what Kubrick was trying to show when Floyd's daughter requested a bush baby for her birthday. She's an adorable, innocent little girl, and she wants something more than a doll. She knows the doll isn't real. The doll is just a machine, a thing that was created by another person. She wants another soul to play with, and no one can blame her. Her daddy's on his way to the moon, her mother isn't home, and her babysitter is too busy to answer the telephone. Something tells me this little girl spends a lot of time alone. Such desires perfectly natural. Hubert didn't have her ask for a dog or a cat or a goldfish. She asked for a bush baby. What's the significance of that? Well, bush babies don't survive very well when they're kept in isolation as pets. They're like little monkeys and they need to live within a group of other little monkeys. When the desires of an innocent little girl tears one away from that group and keeps him in a gilded cage, no matter how much attention she shows him, the bush baby will die from loneliness. When one person's innocent desires have ill consequences for another, the universe falls out of balance. Her daddy is called Dr. Floyd in the movie, but in one of Clark's unused renditions, Floyd was a United States Senator. Where most of this movie focuses on scarcity, scarcity of water for the monkeys, scarcity of life support on the mission to Jupiter, that's why several crew members had to be frozen, this part of the movie shows us the exact opposite. Floyd is on his way to the moon of Earth because a team of scientists that works under him have discovered a black eye buried beneath the lunar surface. What we really need to see here is Floyd's environment. The shuttle that took him from Earth up to the space station was completely empty except for him. Are we to think that it's empty because no one else wants to fly up there and check out the view? Or perhaps the Kubrick just couldn't afford any extras? Of course not. The shuttle was empty, the space station was pretty much empty, and the shuttle from the space station to the lunar surface was empty too. Kubrick used the bone of a dead animal to draw an analogy with this spaceship so that we would perceive the spaceship as a tool. The question we're supposed to ask ourselves is, is this tool in the service of humanity or just a few select individuals? Since Floyd was literally the only passenger on this very expensive trip, and since the space station was virtually empty too, we think it's safe to say this question's been answered. Who put the black eye on the moon? We did. Floyd did. President Kennedy did. We've had our eyes on the moon as long as we can remember. But then, why do we turn away from it as soon as we get there? Mars forever! Notice the red eyes of this lunar spaceship. They turn away from the moon while landing, and a few minutes later, Floyd turns his attention towards Jupiter. They say there was a radio transmission emitted from the black eye that was directed at Jupiter, and this claim needs to be examined carefully. Arthur C. Clarke was an award-winning science fiction writer. He would know that radio signals propagate like bubbles in 360 degrees space throughout three dimensions. Floyd's claim that a radio transmission was aimed at Jupiter sounds almost like junk science. A laser beam could certainly be aimed at Jupiter, microwaves could likely be aimed at Jupiter, but radio waves? Clark and Kubrick would have known this. Floyd and his team would have known it too. But it's questionable whether or not their superiors in Washington Notice the exact moment when the so-called transmission occurs. This is the moment when Floyd or perhaps his old team realize they won't be able to keep the black eye all to themselves forever. Or perhaps they've realized there's no advantage to be gained from it. Maybe Floyd just made up the whole transmission to Jupiter idea so we'd have another budget, I mean project, to command after this one gets shut down. When the monkeys discovered the black eye on Earth, humanity was still a young species. Capital I had not yet taken hold of us, so we were able to admire it as a group without any ill consequences. But by the time Floyd and company arrived on the moon, the black eye had a firm hold on mankind. The important thing to remember is this, the capital I only matters when it's all alone. We could view it as a contest of egos too. Floyd versus the other men in the photo, each of them secretly lamenting that the glory of this discovery is not theirs alone, so they all hear some kind of hallucinated radio transmission as a result of the stress that gives them each an excuse not to take the photograph together. Or perhaps the capital I didn't like the idea of those men turning their backs on it, so it actually did let out some kind of noise to teach them a lesson. Who knows? Really doesn't matter. 
What Kubrick was trying to show us here is that the capital I, the black eye, will defend itself whenever it feels threatened. Floyd had circulated rumors of an outbreak at the Discovery site as an excuse to forbid everyone else access to it. In fact, this whole scene involves the Russians, they have moon bases in 2001 too, asking Floyd about the outbreak on the moon. Floyd basically gives them the finger and says he can't talk about it. And by the way, your ships are still not allowed to land there, even if one of them is in trouble. Of course, he does it in a really nice way. Then he goes into a meeting where everyone practically bows to him. Here, he restates the situation to all his subordinates. This is what we're doing because I said so, and I don't care whether you like it or not. The audience looked like they wanted to give him a medal afterwards. I couldn't help thinking to myself, this fellow's the bloody headmaster. Moonwatcher would be extremely envious of him. Then I remembered Kubrick's fascination with reincarnation when it hit me. What if Moonwatcher actually is this guy? Thanks for watching. We hope you've enjoyed our video. Please let us know in the comments below and subscribe to get the rest of this series as soon as it's released. Until then, please take care of each other and remember there's no such thing as a natural satellite.